We've been talking a little bit about uh, how you figure out exactly what is under your feet in this greenfield or brownfield uh, site. And we made the point that uh, you can basically divide methods of site investigation into two broad categories, either direct methods or indirect methods. Direct methods would be uh, drilling or trenching and sampling that we've talked about already. And indirect methods would be where you don't physically access the subsurface, uh, but you use some geophysical signature of that to be able to say something about it. And so the, the different geophysical signatures that you could imagine would be by measuring the magnetic characteristics of uh, stuff in the subsurface, the electrical resistivity or conductivity or electromagnetic properties, such as radar uh, transmission characteristics, the wave speed, the acoustic velocity of the subsurface, or uh, the density of the subsurface. So all geophysical methods rely on using some kind of proxy uh, that you can link to a soil type. And so they're best used if, uh, for instance, you can combine them with um, some direct method. And so if you have one drill hole, or one trench at least, and you run a profile using geophysics that goes across that, then you have a correlation between something you physically sampled and something that you have a proxy for behavior that allows you to link them together. And so that's the way that uh, geophysics is used. So you don't measure anything about it specifically, but you measure, uh, identify some proxy of those three or four that we've talked about, and you use that to infer exactly not how it is at that specific location, although that's what you cross-reference to, but you extend it out to be able to figure out what it is in the rest of the, the three-dimensional volume that you want to, to deal with. And so that's kind of the, the picture. And so I always think this is kind of an interesting way to, to think about it in terms of this lower diagram. And the reality is, if you think of what a core is, the size of it is probably a couple of inches in diameter. It might be 60, 100 feet deep, uh, might be 200 feet deep, but it's basically a line um, sample as you go across the system. And if you think of the volume of uh, your aquifer outside that, it's many, many orders of magnitude larger than that particular part you've sampled. And so this kind of, I think, puts it in perspective in terms of what you take out versus the magnitude of the size of the system that you and so geophysics is an excellent way to have a big picture that extrapolates it at large scale beyond the, the point or line data points that you have. And so each of these uh, methods and that we'll talk about use some geophysical signature to be able to make that extrapolation. So we'll talk about them in sequence, as was uh, shown in the previous ones. Some are more relevant than others. So geomagnetic methods, as you could imagine, say something about the magnetic susceptibility of stuff that's in the subsurface, which means it has to have iron. And so it means it's really just limited to looking for things like a burial ground for drums, because those would be, or cars for that matter, uh, something that has some sub-signature. And the principle of it is basically uh, that you can profile on top of this uh, material, and if you profile across it and measure the magnetic field of the Earth and how it is modified by the fact that it has some iron in the target, then how it deviates from being a uniform field will sit, allow you to say something about it. And the basic idea is that the, I don't know how it works, but if you imagine, it's not a very good picture of the Earth, if you, if you imagine the Earth <laughs> looking like this, with its iron core in it that spins and does its things, then the way that you use a compass is that it takes the lines of magnetic flux around the Earth, which are symmetric top and bottom, uh, but are basically a, a field that comes out from this, and this is what you use when you use a magnetic compass to be able to see your way around. And also it's this magnetic field that interacts with the solar wind, which allows you to see the aurora, aurora borealis. Uh, that sometimes comes as far south as State College, has come at least a couple of times since I've been here. And it's these lines of uh, magnetic flux 
that are modified by the presence of, electric, uh, of a, an iron target. And so if you think about the closeness of these lines of flux being related to how much of the field is going through this, so more of the field is going through here, it's kind of depleted in this particular case. If you're able to measure the, the, si the magnitude of the magnetic field by going across the top of a target, then if you go quite high above the target, this target here, then you'll see a, bl a blip. If you get lower down and closer to it, then you'd see more details. And as you get progressively closer to the ground surface, then you'd be able to pick up individual features of this. And these individual features would be the individual features of whatever is buried beneath you. I guess this is a car that they've drawn here in this particular one. <laughs> I guess I've taken this out of a book on environmental geophysics. Yeah. This is an upside-down car right here. You can see it. And so this is the strength of the uh, Earth's magnetic field in Tesla's, uh, the name of the car. And depending where you are on the globe, slightly better picture of the Earth and the magnetic flux field coming from the, the core, is that it's inclined, and it's related to the declination that you... Uh, put in on your camp compass, which changes as you change latitude from north to south as you, you go up, the, up uh, from north to south, then what it allows you to do is to measure the strength of the field and record it, and from the strength of the field to say something about both the location and the depth of the target. And because the magnetic field is inclined, uh, this is what it is at... Um, uh, this particular location, you know, what are we? I don't know. What, what is our latitude here? Anyone know? 40-ish? Uh, 40, 40 yeah, 40, 40 degrees. If you do it at roughly 40 degrees, it's a German book, so I think it's probably uh, a bit further north than 40 degrees. But it would give you a signature like this. And so if you measured it as you walk across this, you'd get a plot that would look like this. And from the peak and the trough that you get, uh, you get a couple of pieces of information. You get a separation of these of some length L, and the depth of the target is half L relative to that separation, and it's located somewhere between this peak and trough. So in other words, it gives you not only the physical lateral location, but also the depth of the target as a result of that. And so it's a little limited for the kinds of things we're talking about, because you can't say anything about the subsurface conditions or the reservoir or what the stratigraphy is, but if you're looking for um, uh, buried coins on the beach or 55-gallon drums or cars, then I guess it, it can help you. Um, the kinds of magnetometers fall into two categories. Uh, by far the most widely used are proton magnetometers uh, as opposed to permanent magnetometers. And proton magnetometers have some fluid with a coil the magnetic field induces some spin within the fluid within this beaker and it's able to pick it up somehow. I don't know how it works and I don't need to know how it works. You don't need to know how it works. But you might be interested to know what it looks like and that's exactly what it looks like. I thought there might be some more interesting pictures in this. Basically, um, it's an implement that you wear and uh, sometimes it's a long pole as if you imagine yourself walking across the high wire with a balance pole, not quite so long, maybe eight feet wide uh, with some instrumentation in it and you physically just walk across the land and it records a signal and you plot that signal on the kind of graph that we just showed. Um, not very many uh, pictures here. I guess we've got all kinds of people doing things. I'm looking for someone with a GPS on their hand. Ah, this is probably pretty good. I don't know what this. So you can imagine you'd like to know where you are. It's the other way. You'd like to know two things. You'd like to know what the strength of the magnetic field is, and you'd also like to know where you are when that's measured. And so the way you'd do that, would you'd have a GPS connected to it, and so you'd measure GPS at the same time. So I don't know if that's what this is doing, whether this is the GPS that's measuring it here, this is the proton magnetometer, but the ones that I've certainly seen always have some kind of external bar or apparatus that you're carrying outside that you just walk over the over the ground surface with, and you're able to plot something that looks a bit like what we had here. 
this this thing here. That's it. It's not very widely used, but it's something that's used in the field. Uh, I remember being in Japan. So some of the photographs that we sh showed in the previous week were taken in Japan. I remember this uh, one meeting that we went to, um, looking at the Japanese underground radioactive waste program. And I guess it's probably it's, it's 20 years ago now, but I always remember this uh, story this guy told me that a lot of the people working in the radioactive waste program had also been involved in the other part of the the J Japanese civilian nuclear program, and that is getting fuel to run the reactors. And there's no uranium, not very much uranium in Japan, so you go somewhere where that fuel is. And so this guy had been to, sent to Canada, to the far north, to do this. And he was using a magnetometer to go prospecting for it. And so, as you can imagine, that in using a magnetometer, you don't want to have any iron in your pocket. And so you don't have any car keys in your pocket. And I presume you don't have any belt buckles. But most importantly, for in the kind of Northwest Territories of, of Canada, you don't have a rifle either. And it's sometimes nice to have a rifle because there are rather large predators that walk around. And if you don't have a rifle, sometimes you might be their prey. And so he's recounting this story. He says, I was walking around and, says, and I saw this uh, Arctic hare on the horizon. It was moving around and that was fine. Didn't think anything of it. Kept on going on with my prospecting for uranium and waited for a while. And then all of a sudden it become a, a, a white fox. And uh, that was fine. Didn't think much of it either. And I looked again and then it uh, had become a, a wolf because it was coming closer to me. And then 10 minutes later I looked up and it was a... Uh, it was a polar, a polar bear. <laughs> and, well, he told me the story, so I guess he got out of there in time. <laughs> Helicopter came, picked him up, and took him off somewhere. But anyway, so ma proton magnetometers. Not really very much use in, in groundwater hydrology, but they do allow you to find um, drums. So the same theme. You want to be able to extend it from a borehole over a large volume. You're using some kind of signal as a proxy. So geoelectric methods use electrical parameter that controls the uh, transport of electricity in the subsurface. So if it's AC or DC voltage, then it's electrical conductivity or electrical resistivity, as you could imagine, Ohm's law. And if it's electrical uh, EM, electromagnetic waves, which come from electricity, the induced form, then it's dielectric constant and it's radar that measures those. So we'll talk about geoelectric methods, and then they cover all three of those those signals, and I think it's listed here. DC and AC electricity, of which DC is the more common, and also electromagnetic signals. And so, again, I, I guess what I'm trying to give you here is some appreciation of what the methods are. Not because you're going to do this, but because you might be responsible for hiring someone who does this, or advising someone to hire someone who does this to be able to extend the site investigation. And this is to make the case, this little figure is to make the case that these sounding methods come in two, um, two varieties. And so one might be where you take this sensing method and you traverse from location A to B to measure the value of the resistivity in the ground at a whole bunch of points along the traverse. And you might be doing that because you might be looking for something like a, a leachate pit or a plume that comes out of, uh, of disposed materials. The other thing that you might be doing is to be doing the sounding so that you physically make the sounding wider and wider and wider at one location with the expectation that as you do that, as you get wider, it kind of samples deeper and deeper uh, into the subsurface, and you basically get an electrical profile or a resistivity profile that looks a bit like a drill log. It goes down at one point rather than moves across. And that's what these two things are, are representing. And so the principle is, is basically Ohm's law. And Ohm's law is something like V equals IR. This is voltage. This is uh, current. And this is resistivity. Uh, I guess you could also write it as um, voltage equals current times 
conductivity. So resistance, electrical resistance of a resistor is the reciprocal of its conductance. And so this would be conductance. And if we uh, change this so that we write it as current is equal to Can't do that, can I? That's wrong. This is yes. This is uh, can't do that. But I can write one over C, I guess. Conductance. That's what I was figuring out. So in other words, then that would be that um, is equal to C times V. We think of Darcy's law as Q equals K dh dx. This is current, which is a flux. This is a voltage, uh, a voltage difference between upstream and downstream. And this is conductance. So hydraulic conductivity in Darcy's law and electrical conductance in Ohm's law are similar quantities. If we uh, multiply this through by a cross-sectional area, then this would be something like a volumetric flow rate. And this conductance would be what would control the amount of current that we could flow through the system as we apply a voltage drop along a particular length. And so uh, I'm perhaps not doing a very good job at it, but I'd like to make the, the, the connection that usually if you have a resistor and you measure the resistance of that resistor, it's a discrete thing. It doesn't. You're not measuring a property, but you're measuring the resistance of that component. Likewise, if you look at the conductance of that conduct, conductance of that component, it's a discrete magnitude. If you take a, a block of soil that has a particular resistivity, the property that we like to measure is what we'll refer to as specific resistivity, which is not just in ohms, but is in ohms per meter. It's a measurement of how resistant that clay or sand is. And so what we'd like to do is to be able to measure the specific resistivity of the material, or its specific conductivity, the reciprocal of it, not just the magnitude of the component resistance of a resistor or conductance of a resistor. And so I guess that's the, the feature that we're talking about. So we've made two points. One is we like to measure the overall property of this, which isn't a resistance, but it's a specific res resistivity. And the second is that the law that governs um, electrical flow in the subsurface is exactly the same as Darcy's law, which is exactly the same as a potential flow, which we can use streamlines for. And so with that said, with those two components, if you imagine that if you look at a well where you put water in the ground here and you take it out here, then you could draw a flow net presumably for that, which would describe that behavior. This would be for a flow net that would have a, an impermeable boundary on the top, and so it would be confined to flow underneath, but this is exactly what the flow path would look like. If you take a high voltage here to conform to a high pressure and a low voltage here to conform to a low pressure, and you looked at the flow lines that the electrons took, they would look exactly the same. Since you know that water flows from high head to low head, or high pressure to low pressure, then these are lines of equipotential. And they get to lower and lower equipotential as you go from one to the other. And these are the flow lines. And so what you could think of this is if you have a voltage V1 which is here, and a voltage V2 which is here. If this is higher than V2, then the flow is in this direction. If now you took a voltmeter and put it across this gap, and you measured the voltage across this gap, that voltage would give you some magnitude of this drop. And so what you could do is you could take a voltage, once you put the current in the ground, you could take a voltage to measure this, and you could do a couple of things. You could either make the points A and B wider and wider apart, 
and keep these separations the same. Or you could keep these at the same location and change the straddle, if you like, of the sampling point that you use for the voltages. And then you could use that in some way to say something about the equipotential field you have here. And that's really what it's doing. And so that's all that electrical methods do. You put some uh, voltage in the ground by taking two pieces of rebar. You take a car battery that links them together, put 12 volts into the ground. And then you put two other pieces of rebar into the ground that allow you to, to sample at the particular point. And the idea is to be able to draw in some fashion this flow field because this flow field will be representative of the electrical conductivity distribution of the ground. And I suppose you could imagine that in this case, if I just clean this up a bit from what I've just drawn, if you could imagine the case where you had a layer in here that happened to be a very high conductivity. So in other words, conductance was high or the resistivity was low then what do you think would happen to this flow field? I think all of the current would want to go very quickly down to get into this highway, and then it would go along here, and then it would come back up here. And so it all cramps. So the, the, the equipotential field would be modified by the fact that you do that. And so in other words, by measuring the voltage distribution as you go across here, you're really trying to recreate exactly what this flow field looks like. And if you can do that, then you have some chance of being able to say what's in the subsurface. That's, that's basically the principle. Um, the different kinds of methods that you use are named by their developers. Uh, the Venner method, dipole-dipole methods, and Schlumberger methods. So Schlumberger, the French, well, well it's still a French company, uh, the French well services or oil field services company, the Schlumberger brothers developed a method of electrical sounding which relied on a specific spacing between where you put the voltage into the ground and where you measure the voltage between these. So a Schlumberger array, a Venner array, a dipole-dipole array. So all you do is you put some electricity in the ground, you measure it, and the way in which you change the locations of these sampling locations and you measure the length A and A is it gives you a parameter by which you modify the reading you get. The reading is that you measure a voltage drop between two points. You put a certain amount of current in. So in other words, you put a certain amount of current in between A and B. You measure the voltage drop between M and N. And that's what this term is here. You multiply it by the geometry of the spacing of the, of the in voltage or the influx and the measured voltage, which is this, these equations here, and it gives you an apparent resistivity. You plot that apparent resistivity as a function of each of the spacings, and you get a graph that looks like this. This is the resistivity. So in other words, you measure at one particular spacing the voltage you put in, um, the current you put in, and for this particular spacing, you have a value of k. That gives you a number x at that particular spacing of L. So you plot L, in this case over 2, and the value of x, whatever this is. You change the spacing, you get another value, you get another value. So you get this profile of how the apparent resistivity changes with the spacing. And as you can imagine, as you're changing the spacing of this and getting wider and wider, these equipotentials are going down deeper and sampling deeper in the subsurface. And so you're physically sampling progressively deeper and deeper and deeper here by making this wider and wider. And so this plot that you have here is kind of a borehole profile of a narrow spacing to a deep spacing. And it's equivalent to, you could think of this as the depth into the subsurface in which it's sampled. And it used to be that you take these type curves and you chain, you compare them with analytical solutions for type curves, and it would give you some distribution of till 0.6 of a meter. The specific resistivity of the overburden is 0.93 of meters. To 4.5 meters, it's this amount, and below this is this. 
And that is the solution that absolutely fits that. You don't use curves anymore. You use an algorithm, but it's basically the same, same idea. And so it allows you to be able to, to, to look at what's in the subsurface. Very, very simple. Uh, the equipment's very simple. Um, and we've mentioned one of the ways in which we've used it. So the way in which we've talked about using it is this. You start off with a small array, and you take one measurement and get this point. You use a wider array, and you get this point. And you use an even wider array, and you get this point. And then you convert this to be able to say what, if you had a borehole, it would look like in terms of the resistivities of these units. If you have a borehole that goes through here that isn't cased and has an electrical conductor in it, then you can convert your borehole information against your profile. The other way is that you could take this template of the array and instead of expanding it in the same location, you physically put it down somewhere and measure the resistivity, which would represent the resistivity at this depth. And then you move it here, and that measures the resistivity here. You put it here, and it measures the resistivity here. You plot how that changes as you go across it, and you get a blip, just like using, yeah. And you presume that this part here has a higher resistivity because of this lens. So if you're tracing out the pathway of a road, for instance, then that might be one appropriate way to use it. If you're trying to find the boundary of um, a disposal site, then that might be something that you pick up, or drums or a plume, you'd pick up that way. The plume, of course, would have to be, maybe had chloride or salt ions in it, right, to have a different conductivity for the material around it. But that's basically the, the use of it. So that's resistivity uh, profile. And then the idea is that if you have now a profile which links the values of the res specific resistivity at different depths, then you check to see what these materials might mean. So 44 ohm meters means what? I guess it means it could be clay or sandy silt, because that's what this is. Or it could be domestic garbage, I guess. And so you try your best to be able to link up with exactly what it is. So that's, that's basically it. Nothing, nothing more relatively straightforward. Again, using the uh, resistivity of the subsurface as a proxy. So you can use it in most materials, um, soil and rock. I guess the problems are that if you get a resistivity profile that looks like this, then it may be ambiguous. Because if you reduce the data for the profile that looks like this, then it might be able to match up with something that looks like this or any one of these profiles. And so they're not very discriminating because like fluid flow being a diffusive process, it doesn't really pick up very sharp interfaces uh, very well. And so that's a problem. I think the other one is that if you have a really highly conductive layer that's present on the surface that goes through this, then what it would do is it basically masks all the other material underneath. I think and so if you had a, a very conductive layer on the surface, you would see that layer really well, but you wouldn't see anything very much below that. And so that's typically not the case. So that's one way you could use it. The other way it's used is kind of a, in a static way as well. And so you could imagine that if you have a site that you're remediating, um, you could put some transducers in the ground. And this is a a data example of an EPA web page. And so this is a site that is granite, I think, that was um, uh, saturated with TCE in the fractures. And to remediate it, the plan was to pump in a whole bunch of hot steam. Steam's often hot, I guess, right? Um, and to, see, to allow it to vaporize the stuff that's in place, it would off-gas, and you get it out of the ground. And so the question is, how do you know when you're done? And so one way to do this is to drill some vertical holes. So this is a looking down in plan view. I think these are kind of uh, three sections. Uh, these are some holes that the steam would be pumped into. I guess it might be pumped into one and recovered from others. And also some monitoring holes. And these monitoring holes would have some electrical contacts that you could measure the resistance between point A and point B 
all the way down the sensors along these boreholes. And they don't move anywhere, but if you measure the resistance between, say, the sensors in these two holes at time A, before you start, and you measure it at time B and C and D after you do start, then if you measure any change in resistivity, the only thing that's changing is the saturation of this TCE or whatever it is in the section between these, and that might be a good indicator of when you're done. And so you can't see it very well here, but I think these individual lines, I should have got a color copy, these individual sections here are these individual vertical sections. So this is the surface, this is one borehole, this is a second borehole, and if you see anything faint inside here, they're contour plots of resistivity. And it allows you to pinpoint exactly where you're removing the material from. So I've seen this done for TCE. I've seen this done at Yucca Mountain, where they've been looking at putting heaters in the ground to dry out the subsurface. As you dry it out, you evaporate water. As you evaporate water, water is a nice conductive substance, so the resistivity would increase as you remove a conductive substance from the subsurface. So, so you can use it as a profiling tool, as we've kind of alluded to in these two, or you could use it as a static measurement technique to be able to look at remediation and how remediation progresses with the same kind of limitations. You're measuring changes in electrical resistivity, and so you have to interpret that in terms of what it's doing. And so you want a physical process that actually will change resistivity as you do it. Um, pictures. I think I did. Don't know if we have some here. Bear with me while I pick this up. Should have thought I had it uh, elsewhere. Slides. Yeah, okay. Not that. We recognize some of these. Perhaps I don't. There's one particular one I'm looking for. I can see it very well. It's the last one by the looks of it. So this is yeah, not a very good picture. Uh, with the eye of um, faith, you might see little um, picks in the ground, little thing with a like a skewer, vertical uh, head with a, a skewer head, some cable, and basically off off screen a, a voltmeters. And so this is application to measure uh, in. So if you imagine what you could also do is measure this, is if you think about putting, instead of laying this thing out in terms of putting electricity into the ground at points A and B and measuring at M and N, and then just physically moving it over site, you could also twist it in azimuth. And so around this central part, you could just rotate it. And so if you measured resistivity uh, in the same array on a section that goes through here, and then twist it so it goes through here, and then twist it so it goes through here, and measure the resistivity, then what you might be able to pick up is the orientation of fractures which might be water-filled, because in some cases you'd be aligned along the fractures, and in some cases you'd be aligned across them, and you'd get a different signal. And that picture that was there was just doing basically that. So you can use it in a variety of different, different modes in site investigation. In terms of other exotic methods, you could imagine this is used mainly in exploration for minerals, so we won't talk about it much here. But if you imagine in the same array that we talked about here, you put current into the ground and you measure the voltage between the points, you could turn the current on for a certain amount of time and leave it on and then turn it off. And if you measure the voltage change at the intermediate point, when you turn it on and then when you turn it off, then this change in 
voltage, basically the capacitance of the system, says something about what's in the subsurface. And again, you can use this to be able to say something about what's in the subsurface. So that's a method that's used, but usually used for looking for ores, not for looking for contaminants. Again, something that's not really used in environmental geophysics is to use electromagnetic methods. And so that is where you have a big coil that you put voltage through on the ground, and then that induces an ele electrical field in a source, which might be an ore body, and then you put a core above a coil above that ore body to be able to pick up the secondary field that's induced as a function of this. And so this may be as a function of the uh, signal that you put into the ground yourself, or it might be the electromagnetic signal from a very, very distant transmitter. And so these distant transmitters might be transmitters, for instance, that the military use for being able to communicate with uh, submarines. And so if you're underwater and you want to be able to uh, pick up a signal, then you need a very low, long period, low frequency signal because that will be attenuated the less. And so these transmitters are set up to be able to supply those signals and you can use those in geological exploration as well. But I'm not going to talk about that because it's not so, so relevant. So we made a point that electrical methods you can use AC or DC, alternating current or DC current. Car batteries obviously are DC current and most of the methods that we've talked about so far are really DC. But they can be used with low AC. But the other way they can be used is they can be used with electromagnetic uh, frequencies. And so electromagnetic frequencies would be by using radar, ground penetrating radar, GPR. And that was this exactly what we had here. So if you imagine this, and so this is uh, GPR, not a very advanced version of it, but uh, from 10 years ago. And so one of these is a radar transmitter, and one of these is a radar receiver. So in the same way that a radar signal comes out of the, the control tower or the Doppler radar at uh, State College Airport, this is a small transmitter that does that. It's aimed into the ground. It bounces off whatever the uh, divisions are in the subsurface, and it comes back in a, in a transmitter. And so the schematic of it is basically this. You have a transmitter. You have a receiver, and it's basically a time of flight uh, between going into the ground, bouncing off some kind of surface, and being returned to the top. And so again, this uses a proxy signal. And so the proxy signal in geoelectric methods was the electrical resistivity or conductance. And so in ground penetrating res radar methods, there are two constants are important. The first is the dielectric constant, which is the capacitance of the material versus the capacitance in the vacuum. And that represents whether it would see this uh, contrast or not. Obviously, if there's no contrast in the dielectric constant to pick up, it won't see anything, and you get no reflection. And the other parameter is the uh, speed. And it's the speed of sound. So the speed at which it travels. So if you hear me, the speed of sound, Electromagnetic signals travel at the speed of light, so radar travels at the speed of light, and so it just measures the time from which it's transmitted to the time at which it has done twice the path length and comes back at the receiver, and then it plots that travel time length. Uh, it needs a contrast in the dielectric constant to pick up the interface, otherwise it won't bounce back, but those are the two parameters that um, control that. And so typically what this would look like, actually, this is a, a record. Uh, it's actually a record from one of the locations that we saw the drill rigs at on, in the Arctic. And this vertical axis here, uh, you can't see it, but this is um, 150 nanoseconds, which is a travel time, 200 nanoseconds. 
And so all this is is a plot of what's coming back to the receiver. Comes out of the transmitter, ends back at the receiver. And so this means that it's taken 170 nanoseconds to travel from being put into the ground to coming back to the surface here. And you get a trace which represents some kind of surface that you see is coming through this, which I think is the uh, interface between clay and some sand. This signal here that goes through here is the interface between the riverbed and water. And this signal along here is the interface between water and the ice which the thing was towed across. In this particular case, it was just something that was dragged across the surface. So this is a nice surface that's here. This is time equals zero along here. And you see these curves. And it allows you to plot across here. This is a trace from a borehole. So this is actually ground truth that we know that these are the physical boundaries between these layers. And this is allowing it to be extrapolated as you go up to onto the, the surface of the bank and does whatever it does as it goes across. So, pretty simple uh, method for doing that. 1981, so a while ago. But it works basically on this, this idea. You have a, a transmitter. You record the time that the signal goes out. It has to go down here. It comes back to the receiver. You measure that travel time, and you have one, one of these blips. It gives you one blip, which would be here. There's another signal, or the same signal, that keeps on going down to an even lower boundary and comes back. Obviously, this one takes longer, and this would give you, on a single location, one signal here and one deeper signal. You drag it across this line, so you do a section, and you end up with a continuous record that goes across it. Um, if you look at the velocities between these, The main feature is that if you have a difference in the dielectric constant between two different layers, then it picks up that interface and you get a reflection. The magnitude of the velocity, which is in meters per nanosecond here, the velocity, well, it doesn't change very much, right? 0 0.3, 0 0.33, well, it is for seawater, it's a big difference, but these are 0 0.15, 0 0.12. So these are a, a factor of two different from each other. And so scaling them to be able to get the thickness of the layer requires that you know what's there. But this change in velocity isn't very much because it's basically traveling at some multiple, which is pretty close to the speed of light, I think. Pretty close to the speed of light. And so it allows you to be able to look at basically the, the profile. And yeah, and so that's the way it's plotted. And so these work to be able to pick out layers fast to use. I'm sure you've seen on the Discovery Channel looking for coins and uh, archaeological relics of Machu Picchu and other things uh, to be able to use um, ground penetrating radar. So I'm just zooming up to the list of methods that we'll talk about just so that we can kind of find out exactly where we are. So we talked about the fact that we need to use a signal. Magnetic methods, not so much use because we need oil drums. Electric methods for DC are just profiling using these uh, rebar in the ground to be able to either profile with depth by widening them or to be able to traverse by keeping the set spacing. AC is just a derivative of these DC methods. And electromagnetic methods, these are GPR. So the other methods use other signals, seismic methods, are used but aren't so useful in environmental methods because you can't really pick out the contaminants and gravity methods are almost no use either so we'll, we'll skip through grav uh, gravity methods but we will say something about seismic methods seismic methods are a little bit similar to um, GPR in that now you put some energy into the ground, instead of it being a radar signal, electromagnetic signal that goes into the ground, it's an acoustic signal. So you could shout at the ground, it wouldn't get you very much, 
or you could hit the ground with a sledgehammer, or you could put a stick of dynamite into the ground, or you could shoot it with a shotgun. All of which, except for shouting, are actually methods which are used. Um, and so this acoustic velocity, same one that you're hearing me with, through the air, would travel through the ground, and it would travel through in one of two modes, or you'd use it in one of two ways. You could use the reflected signal, just like we used for GPR, that goes into the ground, bounces, and comes back directly to us, almost exactly where we're standing. And that's exactly what the oil companies use when you go down 10 kilometers to look for a, an oil reservoir. But it hasn't been typically what's been used in environmental geophysics. Rather, in environmental geophysics, it's used what's called um, seismic refraction. So there are two kinds. Reflection and refraction. And refraction merely refers to the fact that if two layers have different seismic velocities, then the product of seismic velocity and its density is called the seismic impedance. So if two layers have a different seismic impedance, then that's what will make them stand out from each other by causing a reflection to occur at this boundary and also causing a refraction to occur, just like Bragg's law through light. When you see a fish and you think you'll grab it, and actually it's over here because the light's been refracted, that's physically what happens in the, the subsurface but with the um, acoustic wave. And so typically what's used in environmental geophysics is refraction rather than reflection. But they all use the fact that they use the seismic impedance, the product of velocity and density, as the proxy to be able to pick out different layers. And so the idea is basically, uh, basically this. So you put some seismic energy into the ground. That will travel so that after 10 milliseconds, the wave front would be here, 20, 30, 40, 45, 50 would be each of these locations. As you go from here to here, this is exactly double this first amount. This is double, triple the first amount, but you'll see that this length here is less than the spacing between here. And the reason for that is that typically if you have a seismic velocity of the upper layer and the seismic velocity of the lower layer is that this lower seismic velocity is typically faster than the one underneath it. So, because it's been compacted. So this might be a soil, this might be a rock. And so if that's the way, then it's then the seismic energy from here can physically go down here. It can scoot along here in this faster layer and it can come back up to the surface, and it can still beat the signal that would come in this upper layer at V1, because it's gone here at V1 for part of the way, it's gone much faster at V2, and then it's come back at V1. And so the, the first arrival at this location is a signal not of this one, but of the one that's come down on this pathway. Uh, if you have another layer, that's even faster than this one, then you'd allow that to happen then for ones that have gone even further out and come back up here. And so if you have a geophone put in the ground at each of these locations that measures when this first arrival comes uh, by, having, by basically doing this, so you have a geophone here, 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 and here. Uh, you either jump on the ground, hit it with a sledgehammer, shoot a shotgun shell into it, or set off a half stick of dynamite, either way, and you measure the first arrivals that arrive here, and you have this, the time at which those first arrivals come, and you plot this arrival, so in other words, at this little geophone, you'd get a trace that looked like this. This is the first arrival, this would be the time of the first arrival, and if you plot that time of the first arrival versus how far the geophone is away, 
So in other words, for this geophone, the first arrival will be this. For this geophone, the first arrival will be here. Then the slope of this line is just the seismic velocity, v1. Where it goes down here and along here to faster velocity and then comes back here so that the first arrival is one that's taken this path, then this change in, if you do exactly the same for these geophones, then this is the seismic velocity of the second layer. Because now this measurement, as you change from each of these geophones, all that you're doing is you're changing the length that it's traveled in this lower layer, which is this extra length here. And so this is a measure of the velocity. So, so there are two pieces of information. You have the ability to get the seismic velocity of V1 and V2. And if you know where it changes over from one slope, these are the first arrivals that come directly along the surface. These are the first arrivals. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. This, I meant this one. These are the first arrivals that go down one layer, across, and then back up. And so this gives you V2. But the other information you have is where it turned over. In other words, this point here is exactly where it's on the verge of this arrives at exactly the same time as this arrives. And so you can use a little equation that allows you to use this location to be able to figure out exactly what this depth is. And so the two, information, two pieces of information are that you can, get, you can get the depth of this and also the seismic velocity. If you get another uh, refracted wave that goes down two layers and goes across and then up again, you'd get a third inflection. So what it would look like then, if you set off an explosive at this point here and you measure these time distance graphs as you go out from it, then for this particular case you see three layers. One layer, two layers, three layers. The slopes of these give you the seismic velocity of the layers and the inflection points give you the depths of these individual layers. That's all. That's all it is. And so this is what you get from laying geophones out all along this trace and shooting here, then shooting here, and getting these two traces, then shooting here, and these two traces, etc. It allows you to build up a picture at each of these locations of what the depth of the layers are and what the seismic velocities are. And so in other words, you'd have a cross section here, a cross section here. These should be vertical lines. And from each of these pieces of information, you basically have kind of a drill hole. But instead of a drill hole, it would give you a depth of these and the acoustic velocities. That's it. So that's it. So that's seismic refraction because it refracts along the length of it. And that's what always used to be used in environmental geophysics because the equipment wasn't sophisticated enough to pick up the very fast travel times between the reflected wave, which would be coming from down here and reflecting back up. But now the equipment is much better and reflection is used as well as seismic refraction. So reflection, you can imagine, I don't know if there's a good picture of it here. Yeah, this is a good picture. Reflection would be if the geophones are much more closely spaced relative to the depth of your layer. So we've talked about very broadly spaced geophones in a pretty thin layer for refraction. But if you look at the opposite, shrink the geophones down so that the, the layer le depth is large. And then we don't have to worry about the refracted waves at all because everything that comes back to us goes down to this layer and it comes back to this geophone. It goes down to this layer, comes back to this geophone. And it would pick up this faster than the other stuff. We have to get out the information that would come directly, but we can do that. And if we filter it, then we get a plot that looks exactly like our radar plot. I guess this is exactly what it is. You can do it with a, a blast, and you can measure these arrival times on the geophones, or you can have some vibrating, a vibrator truck uh, doing this, so you, you stack the signals, you do it multiple times, and you just stack the signals on top of each other to make them a stronger signal. And then these individual signals, the dark part and the light parts, the dark part being the, the first reflection, then these are actually layers of rock. 
This is the double travel time. So the time it takes to go down and back here would be 320 milliseconds, not nanoseconds now, but milliseconds because it's in rock. And it's acoustic velocities, not the speed of light. And so this would be the double travel time that you'd plot, the double travel time of the first arrivals, and this would give you a profile, and these would scale with the individual layers that you have in the ground. And so once you correct these for the seismic velocities, this would actually be what your subsurface looks like. And so that's what, and you can then interpret this to look like some distribution of layers. So this equipment, if we look at some, I'm not sure exactly what we have here. This was radar. These are geophones. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you look at this, this is in Montserrat, the same place that drilling rig was set up. All this is a, uh, a seismic line. So this is a main cable that goes through here that has a whole bunch of conductors in it. Each of these things that come off is a geophone. I'm not sure if I have a picture of them. I do have pictures of them. So a geophone is just a spike that's physically put in the ground. It has a little container on the top that contains a... Um, a piece of metal within an uh, electrical cage. When you shake that little piece of metal inside the cage, it moves relative to the cage. It makes an electrical current within the uh, coil that goes around it because the uh, thing inside it is magnetic and that current gets picked up as an electrical signal and that's the signal that gets sent down along the line to be recorded. So each one of these is a geophone. It comes off here, 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 here. These are just little crocodile clips that clip onto the main um, trunk cable, if you like, that link it up to the main trunk cable, which goes here and then goes through to the um, recording implement. I can't work out if that's a laptop or something else. Um, this is electrical resistivity battery for resistivity. That's out of sequence. I thought I'd had other ones of that. Maybe not. No, that's something else. Okay. Let me look back at the stuff we have here. <coughs> I think they're the very first ones. So this is a a very old twelve channel recorder has the recording cable that goes in here. These are just little amplifiers with gains on them, uh, high gain and low gain, that allow you to amplify the signal. Uh, if I find that, I'll try and move through this. These are exactly what geophones look like. So these little conical pots are physically put into the ground. They're this big, so six inches long, say. They're attached to a cable, and these little couplings have um, clips on them to go onto the trunk line. Got a glove there for scale. This is the cable. This is not Montserrat. This is northern Canada in February. Actually, it's not. It's, it's in October or November, actually. This is the cable that has all of these individual components to it that's being carried out. This is trying to look at the the box that has all the workings in them for this 12-channel uh, seismograph, which you carry in. It's not a huge thing, it's just carried in. And this is how you provide the motive uh, power, the shot. In this case, it's, I think, a, a half stick of dynamite uh, that's rigged up to a blasting cap and put in a pond for good coupling. That's the impetus that we picked up as a signal in the geophones, and then the, the rest is the, the analysis of it rest I think you've seen before. Yeah, the rest you've seen before. Uh, so that's geophysical prospecting. So either seismic refraction or reflection, uh, but the basic ideas are the same. If you get a seismic velocity for the layer and you know when it changes from reflection to refraction, 
you can say something about um, the, lo the thicknesses of the layers and their seismic velocities. If you can link the seismic velocities to typical seismic velocities for materials, sands and gravels and rocks and granites and shales, then you can also use it to interpret what might be in the subsurface. Gravity methods are almost never used. You, you might be using them if you're on the demilitarized zone in um, Korea, where you're looking for tunnels that come under there, because if you take mass out of the ground, then gravity methods allow you to basically measure the local gravitational constant, lowercase g, rho g h for density or, or densities, or, or, or pressures rather, you use rho g h, gravitational acceleration g will change slightly if you take mass out of the ground. And so if you measure the magnitude of g by having a spring with a mass on it, and the gravitational constant, if you reduce the gravitational constant, then for a given spring constant, it will stretch less if the gravitational constant is less. Right? So if you're on the moon, it wouldn't fall down so much. If you're on Earth, it's more. I don't know which planets would have higher G than Earth, but if you're on those planets, then it would stretch more. And so that's all it's measuring. So if you do it in a profile and measure very accurately how gravity changes as you do a profile, then you could pick out places where mass was missing, such as a karst cavern, or a tunnel under the DMZ, and you could try mapping it that way. The only problem is that the corrections that you have to apply to correct for this, which would include things like topography, if you imagine topography uh, on this section as you went across here, then the fact that you have mass missing here, and also you're higher up at different locations, this missing mass that you'd have on the surface would be a correction that you'd have to apply. And so the corrections that you have to make for elevation, missing mass, where you are on the planet, for topography, for the effects of earth tides, and other things are actually quite big compared to the signal side. And so it's not very important for the things that we would want to measure. Because we're also not very interested in finding holes in the ground, typically. And so all of these methods that we've talked about are things that you do on the surface. So you have a drill hole that gives you some section of what's in the, in the subsurface. You want to know what's in the rest of the three-dimensional volume. You can do it by measuring um, using magnetic methods, if it's oil drums. We can use electrical methods if we're using electrical sounding we, or, or gravity or radar, GPR, electrical signals, or we could also use seismic signals. All of the things that we've talked about use those proxies, but they're all measured from the surface. The other way that you might be able to get values of those parameters within the section is not just to guess what they might be for the materials that you have. I guess you could take samples back to the lab and measure the electrical resistivity, measure the seismic velocity, measure the density, etc. Or you could use the same borehole, and you could run a tool on it that would measure those signals directly. And so geophysical well logging is basically that. And so there are a variety of different tools which, if you look at them, would look something like these diagrams on the right. And they would be attached at their top edge to a wire line and they'd physically be dropped down the, the, the well. So they might be a foot or two feet in length in uh, oil wells or hydrocarbon wells. They might be 10 feet long and drop down. But all of them have in common that they have some specific sensor in them that allow you to say something about the rocks in the wall of the well. And those individual sensors would be, I guess, the things that are mentioned here. It might measure the gamma ray radiation that comes out of the rock. And so gamma rays are high in shales and clays, natural gamma rays, and low in sandstones. So if you have a count of gamma rays as you go down along the length of it, it might tell you when you're in a shale as an aquitard or an aquaclude versus not in a shale. 
If you look at the density, then the density of different rocks change, and they use a cesium source and backscattering to be able to say something about what the density of the rock around is. A neutron log um, relies on backscattering of neutron of um, of radiation from a neutron source uh, to be able to back be backscattered from the hydrogen uh, nuclei, I think. Uh, so it detects water and therefore is a measure of moisture contents. An electrical log measures the electrical resistivity of the wall rocks by in a similar way to do you on, you do it on the surface. You put some voltage in, you have a voltmeter between those points, and you use that to calculate what the electrical resistance of the wall rocks is. You could measure the sonic velocity in exactly the same way we've talked about doing it on the surface, but you do it at portions along the log. Measure the temperature with depth. Measure the salinity of the fluids within the borehole. Measure how much overbreak you have, as how wide the coal gets as you get overbreak. And you can also measure the fluid flow rates. We talked about uh, flow meter logs within the logs. And the basic idea is to drop these sons along the, the holes, measure some signal as you go and measure as you go down in depth, you measure some signal, such as the density change as you go down in depth. You measure the gamma ray count as you go down the same borehole with depth. You measure the induced electrical conductivity. You measure uh, the spontaneous potential. And then the idea is that you can compare the trends of all of these different signals, and you can use it to interpret into a real log of what's really in situ, either uh, by using the magnitudes of these and what you expect them to be, or using magnitudes from samples that you've taken and therefore interpret exactly what that might be. And so that's the other way that you might be able to measure these uh, parameters. So relatively sophisticated uh, techniques. I don't think they're used so often in environmental uh, geophysics. They certainly are in hydrocarbon exploration, but they tend to be quite expensive. And so finally, um, in looking at all of this, uh, there are a couple of charts at the end of this. And um, those charts are charts which basically give you an idea as to whether these methods that we've talked about uh, might be useful and in what circumstance would they be useful. So we've made the point that doing geophysics from the surface or doing borehole geophysics we're only measuring a proxy signal that means something if you compare it to what the real rock might have for that signal and so it only can work if there's a contrast so it turns out that seismics for instance is pretty good at picking up stratigraphy but it won't say anything about what the contaminants are that are in place measurements such as GPR or electrical resistivity methods might say something about what a plume looks like because it could pick up the polar nature of looking at you know, the, the bromide or the chloride ion within a plume, which might be different from the water outside that plume, which would have a different signature. And so all of these, their utility would depend on the particular application. So this is just a chart of GPR, electrical magnetic methods, um, seismic seismic methods, resistivity methods, MD, I don't know, um, magnetometer methods, and I think this is organic vapor analysis. So OVA is sticking a, um, a capillary tube in the ground, sucking some air out of it, putting it through a gas chromatograph, and seeing if there are any organic vapors in it as a method of prospecting. MD is magnetic detector. I guess MD is the magnetic detector you see people who are even older than me using on the beach looking for coins. And I think the same kind of matrix there, looking at different uh, sampling methods. So that's it. So I'll leave it there. Um, so geophysical methods and prospecting methods are just a way of filling in for the, the many orders of magnitude larger volume that you can't sample and to try and to link it with ground truthing through direct methods such as drilling and sampling. And that's really all it is. 
some methods are useful, some are less useful, some are more useful. And so at least you have a, an appreciation, hopefully, for those. Great.